Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. During the 1990s, North Korea suffered one of the worst famines of the 20th century. The result of this arduous march, as the regime calls it, was not only a humanitarian catastrophe. The large-scale suffering also ignited economic and social changes that are still shaping the country today. This is the analysis of James Pearson and Daniel Tudor, who argue in their latest book, North Korea Confidential, that this experience, although highly traumatic, helped sow the seeds of capitalism in North Korea. In North Korea Confidential, Tudor and Pearson depict a changing society, communist by outside perception only, where the poor now almost exclusively survive thanks to the little businesses they maintain to complement their almost worthless official wages. Pyongyang is the seat of a new economic elite that conducts trade with China and beyond. Foreign currencies have taken over in some parts of the country as the primary medium of exchange, and consumerism seems almost celebrated as a virtue. The winners of North Korea's economic revolution flash expensive items and take great care in following the latest fashion trends. James Pearson, a foreign correspondent for Reuters in Seoul and co-author of North Korea Confidential, is our guest for this episode. He holds a master's in Oriental Studies from the University of Cambridge and a bachelor's in Chinese and Korean from the University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies, where his interest in North Korea began. James Pearson, welcome to Korea and the World. Hi. I want to ask you the first question we always ask to all our guests. Why Korea? Why Korea? What a good question. I mean, why not Korea? It's such a fascinating place to live in. I cover a career as a, as a journalist, and I don't think I could think of many more interesting places to be in the centre of in this day and age, especially in Northeast Asia, where that's really where things are taking off at the minute. So I came here to cover North and South Korea for the Reuters News Agency, which is what I do now. But I also have quite a long relationship with Korea. As an undergrad, I studied Chinese and Korean. And as part of that, I sort of naturally fell into looking at North Korea. And as a postgrad student, I developed that into a bit more of a, of a research interest. So I kind of um, had Korea on my radar for quite a long time, probably for the last five or six years or so. But I've only been living here for the last two. Um, let's talk about your book, North Korea Confidential, which you co-wrote with Daniel Tudor. The first question I want to ask you is, how do you get your data? Because I think it's obviously very, very difficult to know what exactly is going on there in North Korea. It is. Well, you know what, that is that is the traditional line that people take, right? It's this information black hole. You can't possibly get anything out of it. And actually, that's changed a lot in recent years. It's no longer really the case. In terms of actual data, actual figures, one of the most fascinating tools available to everybody publicly is the Daily NK's website, um, where they have for many years uh, monitored the rise and fall of the grey market currency rates, the value of the North Korean won, and how much a kilogram of rice costs. It's a really, really fascinating um, tool. But the reason they have it is that they have sources in the country that they can call on Chinese mobile phones and get this information out. And it's real information. So that's, that's something we didn't really have before. On top of that, we're seeing a lot more coverage of the country with the likes of Google Earth. There's a lot more open source intelligence, as they say, in US government circles, which is really shining a light on the country. But apart from that, of course, we can't just walk around and knock on people's doors and ask them what they had for breakfast and mm. how much it cost for them to produce it. So that presents us with an enormous challenge. But nonetheless, our line really is that there is more out there if you look for it. We relied a lot on Chinese Korean, Japanese, Russian sources to fill in some of these gaps. Speaking about North Korea, if you look at its depiction in the media, it's usually very, very negative. A country that has nuclear war, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, or a joke, if you look at the movie The Interview, whereas you try to portray North Korea as maybe not a normal place, but a place where there is, you know, normal life. So how do you explain the fact that the media always focus on, you know, the crazy, the weird, the dangerous? That's a tough one, and I by, I by no means speak on behalf of uh, the media in general, let alone Reuters. But one thing to consider is that when North Korea is very blustery and it makes threats and it tests its nuclear devices and it affects the prices of the stock markets, it is 
in either way, it is going to become a news story. At the same time, it seems exponentially odd. The longer the country exists in its current form, the more surreal it seems that it is there, that there is this funny, funny-looking tin pot dictator kind of character in Kim Jong Un. It's not necessarily bad that he be satirized, but the issue with doing that all the time and not looking beyond that is that we ignore the country that exists behind all this. And that's really one of the things we've tried to do with this book. It's really interesting to me that very often North Korea is described as a state, and it's not described in terms of being a country. So we're trying to really turn that on its head. In terms of how the media covers this, there are people who cover it in those terms, myself included, and many of my colleagues here in Seoul working for other news outlets. The trouble is that very often it tends to get buried behind slightly more sensationalist news. And we had a little look at the. And the Reuters headlines, and usually they seem to focus on, you know, weird or crazy. Or so, how do you try to get your different stories across? Is there not a, you know, a risk that, you know, you get more clicks when there's a funny story rather than a story about, you know, black markets in Korea, North Korea, the economy? That stuff is complicated. You almost certainly do. I mean, um, if a slightly funny headline draws in more interest and that makes more more people interested about North Korea, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. I actually think at Reuters we do quite a good job of putting across a very nuanced and uh, slightly more, should I say, accurate um, and more measured version of North Korea. We of course cover things when missiles are launched or when nuclear tests happen or when the country makes a threat. It would be irresponsible of us not to. But when we do that, we do it in a measured way that says, you know, North Korea regularly says this sort of thing. It's up to people how they interpret that. At the same time, we've also extensively covered the likes of the markets, the fact that fashion is a thing in North Korea now and how normal people live. The problem is, is that those stories aren't as well remembered. We interviewed a, a few people in the past few months that you know emphasize on the normal side or the human side of North Korea. We interviewed Professor Andrei Lankov, we uh, interviewed writer Suki Kim. Why do you see uh, you know this recent interest uh, regarding this side of the country, not just the negative but also the positive? Do you think it's a temporary fad, you know, that now we're more looking into the humane side, or is this a serious trend? I think it's a serious trend, and I think it's one to really, really be welcomed. It's fantastic that so many people are trying to do the same kind of thing. North Korea is a country. It, it has its state, it has its government too, but I think people also get very quickly bored of that. It's really, really good to see more and more people try and focus on it from, from this kind of angle. And I also think there's been a lot more interest in North Korea over the years, which has kind of opened the way within, say, the book market or the literature market to allow for these kind of things to come in. I think it will probably keep going on for a long time. I think people only have a, a certain amount of patience. I mean, don't forget, North Korea for many years, in terms of how it was discussed or covered by journalists and academics, was largely dominated by people in security or nuclear policy circles. If you look at the book market in particular, it wasn't really until Barbara Demick's Nothing to Envy came out that we had any kind of solid stories out there based on people's everyday lives. They existed, but they just weren't these big bestsellers. About a year ago, Professor Lankov wrote in the New York Times, and I quote, The farther one is from the Korean Peninsula, the more one will find people worried about the recent developments here. Do you agree and do you feel that a book like yours could have only been written by someone, you know, who was close? I do agree with what Professor Lankov says because I'm sure that my mother would be included in the people who, when they see these headlines, worry that, you know, we're on the brink of um, nuclear war. I think she's probably a lot more used to it now. It's certainly the case that if you're on the outside of Korea, there are many things about the country, not just this, that you're just simply not going to understand. That's not unique to Korea. It's the same, um, for example, I was speaking the other day to somebody from Jordan who is really struggling to attract people to come to their country because it's viewed as the, on the outside as being in the grips of the Islamic State when it isn't. So it's, it's a natural phenomenon that if you're not in the country, you are simply not going to understand it in the same way. Admittedly, sitting here in South Korea, we are not in North Korea, we are presented mm. with a similar kind of challenge. I do think you have to be, at least on the Korean Peninsula, you have to be talking to Koreans. It really ought to go without saying, in their own language, to understand what's going on here. How do South Koreans react to your book? Because, in effect, the two countries are at war, and you are humanizing North Korea, and humanizing the enemy is, I think, the ultimate taboo of conflict. We're not humanizing the state per se, though. Mm. So uh, I would like to see w how South Koreans react to the book. But it hasn't come out in Korean yet, so we won't really fully know until it does. 
there's a good chance that it will be labelled pro North Korean, perhaps because of that. But that's just that's not the nature of the book. That's the nature of South Korean politics. At the same time, I think some of the themes in here, uh, again, something which ought to go without saying, that the North Koreans are still people too, and they have the same desires and the same drives as many South Koreans, really ought to be welcomed. Um, but I think South Koreans know that. So you start your book by mentioning the famine that occurred in North Korea in the 1990s, probably one of the worst periods of the DPRK since the Korean War. What happened and what were the causes? I think a lot of people have heard about it, but they don't exactly know what it entails. In terms of a brief history, history lesson, when North Korea was founded in the 1940s and was very much sort of modelled on the Soviet Union, from which it derived a huge amount of support, both ideologically, politically and economically, it did have a functioning public distribution system, which is the old uh, Soviet terminology for a rationing system, essentially. So farmers would produce food, they would give it to the state, and the state would distribute it equally to the people. The problem with that system is that it didn't always work, and of course some people are more, slightly more equal than others. And this carried on for, for many, many years. North Korea, in fact, became an expert at extracting aid from its Soviet allies, and also China after the Sino-Soviet split. But by the time the wall came down and the Soviet Union ended in 1991, North Korean aid essentially dried up. There were many people, in fact, at the time who thought this would also be the end of North Korea. And I suppose, arguably, in terms of the famine and what that caused, you could argue that it was. Hmm. But the people who said that they thought the state was going to actually collapse, most of those guys are sadly dead. It's kind of ironic that North Korea has outlived those people in many ways. So once this Soviet aid had run out, this really took its toll on the North Korean agricultural and food distribution system, its economic system. North Korea wasn't as uh, integrated with the Soviet economies as maybe some other satellite states were, but nevertheless it really heavily relied on it, as I'm sure you guys know. Okay. So this this had also not really been reformed under any North Korean leader uh, running up until the awful famine. And by the time it got to about, I think, 1995 or so is about the height of the famine, North Korea had also suffered from terrible floods. Uh, it was also internationally uh, isolated, and its economy was in absolute pieces. In North Korean propaganda, they, of course, blame external influences, I think. Kim Jong-il has, of course, a lot to answer for uh, in terms of not really fixing his economic system. Nonetheless, this created this horrific famine. The estimates of how many people died vary greatly. Depending on who you talk to, depending on what source you read, it can be a couple hundred thousand, can even be a couple of million. After the first hundred thousand or so, somehow the number doesn't seem to matter. It is death and tragedy on a completely unfathomable scale. But out of this tragic period, a really, really interesting economic system was born. People had to develop coping strategies to get through uh, this horrible time. They realised that the public distribution system was no longer able to provide them food, so they had to look for it elsewhere. This unofficial system already existed in, in many different ways, but what the famine did was to really necessitate this system. And by the end of the famine, some estimates would say there were about 95% of people were getting their food from the unofficial economy and not the state. Yes, you're right. The famine sowed the seed of marketization in North Korea. So what happened? The people started to organize black markets, tried to find a way to survive because the state had failed them? Well, that's right. These black markets already existed. And what the, what the famine was, in some ways, as tragic as it was, was a catalyst to actually make these things grow much larger. So that's something we try and we come back to quite regularly in, in the book. It's difficult to sort of say, well, look, after, despite this tragic time, it's actually done a lot of good for the economy. One example I often cite is one that I borrowed from my friend Chris Green at the Daily NK, that he tells the story of this man called Mr Lee. And Mr Lee had been a party uh, loyalist. He had gone to a party school, and he got a job up in the border city of uh, Hiesan, which is a small town, really, on the Chinese um, border, which is separated by the Yala River. And the river in places there is very narrow, it's very rural, it's very mountainous. And Mr. Lee had about 28 workers under his care. And when he was in this position and at the height of the famine, he felt extremely isolated. He wasn't getting his food rations. And suddenly, when you're in that kind of position and you need to survive, your political ideology suddenly doesn't matter as much. What matters is, can you eat? And what matters is your own survival. And 
rather than continuing his, I forget what his actual job was, but it's irrelevant at this stage, rather than continuing his daily party activities, his, he instructed the 28 men in his care to go to the mountains around Hyesan, where they were based, collect wild herbs which were popular in China for, and, and used in Chinese medicine. And using a contact he developed in China, he would float these herbs in bags attached to an old bicycle in a tube float it across the river to the contact who was waiting on the other side, who in return would float back flour. And with that flour, they could make food, and Mr. Lee could feed his men. So this kind of thing had already been going on for a long time. What's interesting in this example is here you have a party card-carrying party guy um, who has turned to this unofficial economy out of complete necessity. And that is a really good example of just, just how the famine changed people's, both people's trust and relationship they have with the government, but also it taught them that they had to rely on the, the unofficial economy if they wanted their needs to be met. But did these party loyalists then stay loyal, or did they become schizophrenic in the sense that in the outside they were still party members, but you know there was a new reality out there? Some of them did, and that's a really good question. You would think that by the end of this, by the time that you feel the government can no longer provide for you, you would no longer trust in it in, in any way. But actually, there are people, I can think of another example of a, a esteemed professor I once met in the third country who had been based in Pyongyang. And during the famine, he and his wife would go out and they would sell sujebi outside Pyongyang train station. And sujebi is the sort of dumpling, vegetable soup thing very popular in Korean cuisine and he and his wife would go down there and they would sell this soup and they would flog it outside the train station and with the profits from that they would buy more flour they could make more soup and they could both eat and also have money to survive in order to buy more food and supplies and survive this famine but at the time the official propaganda was blaming external forces it was described as an arduous march which was a in this case a euphemism for absolute death and devastation and starvation, but was based on an old part of Kimist mythology whereby uh, Kim Il-sung and his guerrilla comrades had gone on an arduous march. Mm. So it's not necessarily the case that people had all blamed the state. It certainly questioned the trust that they had, but it didn't necessarily cause an instant outflux of people. Defector numbers certainly rised, but it didn't It didn't spell the downfall of the state. It may have spelled the downfall of North Korea as we knew it because the economic system was so affected by it. But why did the regime not collapse? How could it not collapse? I mean, it, it had to withstand the end of the Soviet Union, Tiananmen, which you know had some ripple effect, and then a massive famine. One really important thing to consider is just how much control the government had on outside information. And especially in the 1990s, when we didn't really have the internet, North Korea especially did not have the internet. There were no mobile phones. So there was a few uh, radio broadcasts coming into the country too. So the news of the outside world, the severity and the scale of what was happening just simply wasn't common knowledge in the same way that we might expect it to be. So I think if you consider the fact that information was certainly not as freely freely available uh, as it is now, this goes some way to explaining why the state didn't collapse, or rather why people did not revolt in to this kind of scale that we might have expected them to. So North Koreans uh, gradually became capitalists, so to speak, to survive. Uh, There's a great quote in your book. You say that North Koreans are now primarily concerned about making money. So is this a move towards a more capitalistic system out of necessity? Or do you see now a cultural shift, a societal shift in Pyongyang or somewhere else? I think we see both. Some of the, the North Koreans I've met have been the most capitalist people I think I've ever come across. Even people in state owned enterprises. If you talk to them and they know that you're coming from somewhere else and you have maybe you have some contacts, they might suggest business ideas with you. My co-author, Daniel Tudor, runs a um, string of uh, mildly successful craft beer pubs here in uh, South Korea. And when he told some North Koreans in Pyongyang about his beer business, some of them said, oh, let's go into business together. Maybe we could, you know, we could split the profits. We could, uh, maybe you could sell North Korean beer somewhere else. And of course, you know, it would cause all sorts of political problems. But nonetheless, it wasn't uh, necessarily an ideological issue for them to raise that as an idea. So the, the point is, is that the state pays people essentially nothing. The salaries don't mean anything because of the eccentricities of the way the black market sets the real value of the one. So if your salary doesn't mean anything, and when you are paid your salary in North Korea, you very often get some rationing books, this public distribution system still exists to an extent. So that's all it's really good for. 
But if you're paid the equivalent of not even 50 cents in US dollars per month, then you have no choice if you want to survive than to turn to outside economic activity. As a result, productivity in the workplace is extremely low and people working for state-owned enterprises, of which they are many, are doing anything they can to to raise as much money as possible. And this naturally creates a very, very straightforward form of capitalism and entrepreneurship in North Koreans, of all people. It's a really fascinating development. And again, the famine was one of the things which was the catalyst for this. So you write about one big externality of this mercantilism in North Korea, bribery, corruption, everything and everyone can be bought. Is this the way the state is now surviving through a new form of tax? Tax is an interesting way to describe it. Rather than take that money and distribute it equally for the benefit of the people, it kind of trickles up, right? You have to kind of buy your way in and out of all sorts of trouble and positions. I mean, don't forget, of course, there is a limit to that. If you have political influence or if you're from a certain background, there are certain things you can't do. But one really interesting product of this kind of bribery market as well, bearing in mind that people, especially in official positions and in positions of authority and power, like the police or like the uh, SSD, which is the equivalent of the Stasi, need this money to survive. One thing it does do is it's an enabler for people. So if you do have the money and you're not from the right kind of background to get into a certain school, for example, a little bribe might help you get on your way. Or maybe you've been caught wearing skinny jeans, for example. Skinny jeans, believe it or not, are incredibly popular in North Korea and you can buy them in the markets, albeit they flare out at the bottom and you have to wear a long coat to uh, to hide it. But uh, nevertheless, they, they do exist. It's one of many things that the, the markets have um, created. But if you're caught wearing them, you might be taken away by the uh, local police or you might be fined, you might be expected to traditionally uh, be detained even. But if you are from a uh, trading family or you are in possession of some kind of wealth or money, um, very often you can simply buy your way out of that trouble. So whilst bribery is naturally something we would see to be very corrupt, and it is a huge headache for every uh, North Korean that has to uh, work against it, it is nevertheless, oddly, a social equaliser. So is it fair to say that North Korea is now one country, two systems, an official economy and ruins, but then a, let's say, bustling or at least growing informal economy that is, you know, carrying really its weight. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. It's one country with two systems. There's this unofficial economy, the black markets, which drive things, they set the exchange rates. And then there is this official economy, which does still have some role to play, right? Because farms are still state managed and there is some food still that is distributed by the state because of that. But nonetheless, it certainly doesn't wield the influence that it once did. You mentioned in the book that the government is attempting to regularize this whole or regulate this whole legal market activity and trying to integrate it within you know, North Korea's official economy. How is it doing so? Can it do it? And can, can it bring about change? One really interesting product of this new economic order is that the country functions essentially with two exchange rates for its own currency. The government sets an official exchange rate of about 96 to 98, one to the dollar. But the black market sets it at around 8,000, and it's stabilised at that much over the last couple of years or so. In 2009, when uh, this marketization in the post-famine years had really, really taken off, when people had more and more money and were stashing it, you couldn't really be seen to spend it. The government essentially devalued its currency. We refer to it as a currency reform, but it was more like a devaluation. They knocked two zeros off the end of every note, and so your 100,001 you had saved up suddenly became 1,001, and all your savings were confiscated, essentially. This, again, created um, mistrust between the people and the state. So they already didn't trust the state with their food, and then they didn't trust the state with monetary policy either. So what you have is a second catalyst, which really, in the end, helps this marketization grow further. Now, because of this, it means that the way that things are priced, if you are paying for them in one, is very, very different to the way that the government might price them. For example, the Pyongyang metro costs something like 5 won a ticket, which according to the official exchange rate is very, very cheap, but according to the unofficial exchange rate is such a small amount that I don't think there is a single coin or note in any currency anywhere that would be small enough to cover it. And in fact, the day when the Pyongyang metro starts charging, say, 
5,000 won instead of 5 for its metro tickets would be a very interesting day indeed for the North Korean economy. But it hasn't got to that stage yet. What we see instead is in North Korean special economic zones, for example, we see the use of the grey market exchange rate to price goods. And that's a really interesting example of the government trying to accommodate these new changes in its economy. When the government announced several other special economic zones, in one of the first stories I did when I joined Reuters about 18 months ago, I asked a North Korean spokesperson, but believe it or not, they are contactable, do you plan to roll out the same grey market rates across the rest of the country in these new special economic zones? And he said, yes, we do. And that, again, is another interesting example of the state accommodating these changes. The state is, rather than leading these economic changes, it's having to follow them. It also happens in Pyongyang. If you go into a Pyongyang toy shop, as um, a friend of mine once did and sent me a photo of the prices, you might see something like a basketball for sale. And I only pick a basketball for sale because of Dennis Rodman and how popular uh, basketball has become since those interesting, shall we say, trips. And the basketball might be priced at about 45,000 won in a public setting. And this is what I would say is an example of a grey market exchange rate. Because if they were using the official exchange rate of 96 or 98 won to the dollar, that basketball would be worth about 500 and something dollars, which is an incredible amount of money to pay for a basketball, especially the kind of cheap street plastic basketballs that you're going to get imported from China into somewhere like Pyongyang. Mm. But according to the unofficial rate, according to the black market rate, if you were to um, use a a rate of about 8,000, as the black market does, that same basketball is suddenly worth about $5 or $6, which is a much more reasonable price to pay. But the fact that we see that happening on the streets in Pyongyang is again another example of just how much this kind of black market activity has permeated into the rest of society. Society. You wrote that a majority, actually, of, of market transactions conducted in North Korea are now conducted in foreign currencies. Why are North Koreans more and more using the yuan, the dollar, the euro, instead of their own currency? The simplest answer is that North Koreans do not trust the government with the won. As I mentioned before, mm. when once they knocked a couple of zeros off the banknotes and confiscated everyone's money, that really taught people to not, not trust the government with, with their money. Um, an effect of that is that people are spending more of their won and getting rid of it. It's also kind of become okay to do that in recent years, which is very interesting. But the bottom line is is that the Chinese yuan and dollars, and especially euros, which are also very, very popular, bearing in mind North Korea suffers heavily from US-related sanctions, so dollars are kind of becoming more and more untouchable. Euros are uh, slightly more favoured amongst the elite and uh, high-level traders. Those currencies don't lose their value. People know that if they have dollars, if they have euros, they are safe. They they have proper insurance with foreign currency, and they don't with the North Korean one. And especially if you look in um, villages and towns close to the Chinese border, According to recent research, some people argue that up to 90% of transactions done in the market in those areas are probably being u- done uh, using Chinese renminbi, which is uh, another fascinating it's example. It's staggering. It's incredible. It's, uh, it's essentially, and again, my friend uh, Chris Green at the Daily NK would describe it as the yuaninization of the North Korean economy as opposed to a dollar economy or dollarization. Um, it's a really, really interesting phenomenon. And it's also a big problem for the government. So we see the government trying to accommodate this and deal with this phenomenon. One thing they've done in recent months is to get rid of their highest denomination banknote. As it stands, the highest denomination is 5,000. And up until very recently, that had a picture of Kim Il-sung on it. Of course, the highest leader, the highest man in the whole land. So, of course, he goes on the highest value note. Now, if the official exchange rate at 96.1 to the dollar uh, still stands, then 5,001 is not necessarily an unreasonable note to have. The problem is that the grey market and the black market is now so pervasive across the whole country that unless you want to pay for your flat screen television with a wheelbarrow of one, you need a higher denomination Mm. note. So what they've done is they've withdrawn the note which had Kim Il-sung on it, not for political reasons, not because he's not still the top dog in the country, and they've introduced another one which, instead of having his face on, has his birthplace on. Now, we don't know what new note they're going to bring in yet. We still haven't heard anything from it, we don't know when they're going to do it, and we don't know how much it's going to be. But a sensible estimate would say 
perhaps they'll bring in maybe even a 50,000 won note and they'll copy the South Korean system. Maybe they'll bring in a 10,000 and then a 50,000. And doing so would be a much more sensible thing to do if the government wants to maintain any control over its own money. So if they do do that, that's going to be a really, really interesting development. And I would encourage your listeners to watch out for that news if and when it breaks, hopefully on Reuters first. (laughs) Who are the winners and losers in this economy? In your book, you mentioned that some of the top apartments in Pyongyang are negotiated around $250,000. Who has that kind of money in North Korea? More people than you think have that kind of money in North Korea. We, I think you would, you would assume, perhaps, on the outside, that only Kim Jong-un and his immediate cronies would have that amount of money. In fact, they have a lot more. They have most Billions of them, probably multi, yeah, multi-billions at least. There are indeed, though, a lot of people engaged in some kind of trade with the outside. And there's also the Hwagyo, which are the Chinese Koreans who have gone from becoming one of the poorest aspects of North Korean uh, society to one of the richest because of their links with the booming China. It doesn't take much to amass that kind of fortune if you have been like, say, Mr. Lee and floating your Chinese herbs across the river for several years and built up a supply and demand and become one of these new capitalists. It's not the case that this is enabling everyone. There are still plenty of very poor people who are very oppressed and live you know, the kind of terrible lives that we, on the outside, expect North Koreans to lead. Yet, at the same time, there is this money floating around in the economy. It's not hard to amass this kind of fortune if you have something that you want to sell. The people who are most likely to have it, though, are the ones who are engaged in some sort of state-sponsored enterprise. So they could be from, let's take a random example, they could be from the Korean International Tourism Corporation, which is the North Korean state-owned body which works with foreign tour companies and tourists. Now, they are also tasked with making money because the state doesn't necessarily provide them. They have their own mini economies too. So they might be involved in setting up restaurants or investing in restaurants even outside the country and in China. Another example might be the Socialist Youth League, an extremely ideological organisation based on Russia's young pioneers um, and an organisation that we saw across the entire Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. And those guys are also engaged in this. They might have a trading company, they might run a hotel in Pyongyang, and it's built using their guys, it's built using their their money, and the profits stay within that state enterprise. And if you are an official and in charge of one of these um, companies, then you can be sitting on quite a lot of money. And you don't necessarily need to have come from the perfect North Korean political class of somebody with a revolutionary history or close links to the leadership. You could just be some guy who's got lucky and has bought his way into that position. Um, It, of course, helps if you have political connections. But again, money has become an enabler for people who don't. How would you qualify the relationship between this new capitalist class and the government? Are they tolerated or are they maybe simply the same people in the end? They're all in it together, to borrow a much overused British political slogan. They are kind of all involved in the same thing. In in many cases, they are one and the same. But in terms of uh, party and what the party might have to say about it, you, you shouldn't really expect to see any publicly facing appreciation of this kind of activity. The way that we describe it in the book is it's a bit like Victorian Britain and sex. Everybody is doing it, and doing it in far more raunchy ways than you might expect, but nobody is talking about it or really admitting it. It's kind of whispering and talking about it with people who you know are also up to it. It is now clear, I think, that the people do not really believe in the state's economic policy anymore. But does that really mean that they would also like political change? Is there a fine line there? It's important that you bring them up as two different things. It's often the case, I think, that we assume the North Koreans are busting for some sort of political reform and improvement in their human rights. And indeed, many of them are, and they absolutely should have proved human rights in existence there in North Korea. But for the most part, I think the thing which people are most concerned with is how much money they can make and whether or not the government is going to give them economic freedoms. And indeed, we could make the same argument with China, which has not undergone the kind of democratization that many people thought it might have to in order to continue with its economic reforms. China is a country which has economically completely transformed itself in much the same way. It is still ruled by 
a party which calls itself communist and still practices um, many communist-esque or Soviet-esque um, economic policies, yet nonetheless is one of the most capitalist um, societies in the world. And North Korea shares many similar traits in that respect. Is this new capitalist class sympathetic to the United States and South Korea? Because you mentioned how they consume a lot of cultural products from these two countries. South Korean colloquialisms and you know slang terms are now more and more common in Pyongyang. Does that also change the way they see the supposedly arch enemy? Yeah, I think it does. And I think that as we have tried to do with the book and point out that North Koreans are people too, and we should engage with them on that level and not necessarily on the level of the state in in terms of how we understand the country, North Koreans, I think, do the same thing. I I don't think that um, certainly the ones who are a bit more worldly and maybe engaged in this trade, maybe have more access to information, they're not necessarily going to agree that all Americans are bastards, for example, or that South Koreans are, are puppets. That, of course, still features in, and there are ideological people who who are quite kind of hardcore and nationalist in that sense, nationalist in both an ethno and state sense. But it's certainly something that people will pay lip service to in the propaganda, but doesn't necessarily reflect the reality on the ground. One of the things that's really changing that is information. So the more South Korean dramas or films that North Koreans watch, the more they realise, oh, they're just like us. And the same goes for American films too. The interesting country that North Korea has a relationship with on the personal level uh, is with China. One of the things that you often hear remarked in Pyongyang amongst uh, officials engaged in this kind of trade with the outside, many of whom, in fact, probably the overwhelming majority of whom are engaged with China, is that they are kind of uneasy about this reliance that they have on China. China, at the same time, is investing a lot in infrastructure and trying to extract things from North Korea, especially their rare earth, of which North Korea has a lot and of which China needs a lot. But this has kind of created an uneasy relationship. North Korea doesn't want to necessarily... I attribute a voice to all of them here, but the Mm. elite, the officials, the guys in charge, don't necessarily want to adopt that kind of Chinese reform. They want to still be able to pay lip service to their ideology, but they want to branch out. But that's, of course, never going to happen as long as they're still blustery and uh, making very poorly judged threats, should I say. But isn't the regime somehow losing its grip? You're right that there is a decline in genuine loyalty to the regime, that nowadays watching foreign TV, if you're caught, well, you can just pay a bribe, it's fine. There's a good chance you won't have any jail time. There seems to be some kind of loosening up up there. There is in the sense that people get their heads down and get on with it in terms of the relationship they might have with the regime. Whether or not this constitutes a real threat to the regime in terms of an existential one is another question. I think for the most part it probably doesn't. One thing we really, really need to bear in mind when we think about this is that there are many North Koreans in positions of power who do not want to be the taxi drivers in Seoul on the day that the the wall falls. It's not because being a taxi driver in Seoul uh, is a bad job, on the contrary. I'm sure it's lots of fun. But the, the point is, is that if you are a party cadre, if you are a uh, state-sponsored trader and you are sitting in all this cash and you can probably be living a comparatively comfortable life in Pyongyang, you don't want to lose all that. Yeah, yeah, the, you have everything to lose from unification, actually. Precisely. Yeah. In many mm-hmm. cases, yeah. And which speaks a lot to the challenges of ever trying to achieve unification in that regard. One example we list in the book um, of something that happened somewhere else was the former dictator of Sierra Leone, who now lives in a, in a slum with his mother and drinks gin all day, uh, reminisces on his, uh, of his huge fall from grace. So these officials, these people who recognise the need to change, who, who do have the power to change things, albeit um, slowly, are most concerned with, after making money, with their own security and the safety and security of their own families. Who's ultimately in charge in North Korea, though? Uh, Do you see a switch, a transition, let's say, from the political elites to the money-making elites when it comes to decision-making, to uh, infrastructure decisions? Do you see a strengthening of market forces vis-à-vis the state? People who have money certainly have a lot more agency than they had, and they have a lot more influence than they used to have. In terms of the political influence they have at the very top, I don't think this necessarily changes things. But on that note, one interesting thing to take into consideration is just how that leadership actually works. We often, if we look at the propaganda, if we look at the way the state portrays Kim Jong-un and the Kim family in particular, you'd be forgiven for thinking this man sits on the throne and makes every single decision about the whole country. And in some respects, he does. But at the same time, he has a group of 
people around him from different factions, from with different backgrounds and with competing interests, all uh, using him essentially to achieve their own their own aims. It's like a mutual dependency between the Kim brand and the people around him. And this is one of the reasons perhaps why we've seen so much political upheaval since Kim Jong-un came into power. And in that I include the execution of his uncle, Jang Song Tech. It's, um, it's, it, it demonstrates somewhat the kind of instability that that kind of system might create. In some ways, it might be more helpful to think of someone like Kim Jong-un as the young trust fund hipster who's inherited the new business and with it his dad's board, who don't necessarily see things the same way that he does. All these changes we've been talking about, this new capitalist class, is this just the bubble of Pyongyang, you know, all these rich people who are you know, fortunate enough to be in the capital and be well-connected, or is really the entire country changing? And you can really say that your book is talking about a structural uh, element of, of North Korea. We're, we're really talking about North Korea as it exists now today in 2015. And it's not just in Pyongyang, no. I mean, of course, like any other country, the wealth and the power is centred on the capital. But then it's places where there are ports and where the trade is and where things are imported and where things are exported. And no region is more affected than that than the rural region on the border with China, where the border has become so porous that it has become very easy to trade. The government has tried to crack down on that in um, recent years, but nonetheless, the money flows around quite a lot there. So it wouldn't be accurate to say that it is something that is reserved only for Pyongyang. That kind of phenomenon is, is really only applicable to the likes of political decisions. So you have maybe you have more political nous or, or influence if you are in somewhere like Pyongyang. But you could e- just as easily be somewhere in uh, like Chongjin and be a, a miner or working in a state factory and your wage might be paid according to black market rates or something. Or you might be able to um, go down and get even a can of Coke in a rural black market, which is, uh, you know, the epitome of American capitalism, the traditional enemy. Uh, and there it is, along with Marble Reds for sale for, for dollars in dollars or yen or, or one if you have it. North Korea is under a rather strict sanctions regime. So how can the elite in Pyongyang or elsewhere source luxury goods? Where does it all come from? It's a good question. And it's, it's, it's an endless game that the likes of the UN, the EU, the US has in trying to curb the bought and the proliferation of not just luxury goods, but also of, of nuclear weapons, ballistic um, missile materials in North Korea. It's shockingly easy, should I say for North Korean officials to import luxury goods from outside the country, whether that be by smuggling it inside North Korean ships, which have become very much the centre of the UN's attention in recent months and even in recent weeks, or by simply stuffing the back of a Chinese lorry with flat screen TVs, whiskey, golden watches, whatever you want, and driving it to Pyongyang. It really is that simple. It should therefore be no surprise when we see in state photographs Kim Jong-un wearing a Swiss Movado watch, or in the corner of one photograph I remember spotting a six or seven million dollar luxury yacht. It's very easy for them to get this kind of thing in the country. And not only that, the state and the Kim family in particular has an entire organisation devoted solely to that called Office 39, which goes all around the world procuring everything from luxury food to Rolex watches to you name it, for the leadership. If you read the memoirs of Kim Jong-il's former sushi chef, which is a, one of the bizarrest sources, I think, to have ever shed light on North Korea, but nonetheless, he exists. He tells stories of flying to Tokyo to get a McDonald's for um, the Kim family, or a particular kind of fish, or going shopping at the state's expense. When, when you have the entire state at your disposal to get whatever you want, it's um, very, very easy, and it poses um, a very, very significant challenge to the UN and its member states when it comes to enforcing those sanctions. Outside the Kim family, is materialism, is self-expression through fashion, as you mentioned, through, you know, your choices of entertainment, is that tolerated by the party or do you still need to somehow, you know, maintain a composed figure? We talk a lot in the book about things like fashion because it's one of the things which reminds us that we're all the same. You know, we're kind of worried about what we look like or we want to make sure we're wearing nice clothes. And so, yeah, there are stories of people, as I mentioned earlier, wearing skinny jeans or dyeing their hair in different colours, wearing imported Chinese clothes. 
And even North Korea has its own fashion icons. You look at the likes of, you told you, Kim Jong-un's wife, when she got her hair cut in a certain way, that haircut became really popular. The kind of pencil skirt she was wearing also became really popular. But there is, of course, still a limit to this. It is still um, a, a conservative country. There's still Korea, but a very, albeit a very old-fashioned conservative and dictatory career. So there are, there are definite limits to this, not to the extent necessarily whereby the state requires all men to get Kim Jong-un haircuts. That is just simply not true, despite how much the media, and not Reuters, I'm proud to say, fawned over that story. But nonetheless, there are still standards. You won't see somebody with long hair or dreads walking around uh, Pyongyang. You won't really see men with beards either. These things are enforced, and if you are caught to be doing something different, like, for example, your hair is slightly too long, organisations like the Socialist Socialist Youth League, made up of sort of very kind of swatty, loyalist kids a lot of the time, will snitch on you, and you will be reported and told to straighten yourself out. Isn't there a risk with a book like yours to somehow, I don't want to use the term whitewash, but, you know, maybe give too much a good uh, image of North Korea because, you know, there is this developing reality, which we do not deny, you know, of having leisure of fashion, uh, you know, capitalistic developments in North Korea. But at the same time, you have hundreds of thousands of political prisoners. You have that infamous satellite picture of North Korea at night that is entirely dark, except for Pyongyang. You know, isn't there that, that danger somewhere? Or do you think it's a message that has to be sent out because everybody else is talking about the other part anyway? Well, if we can convince readers that North Koreans are still normal people who are driven by the same kind of desires as they are, whether it be love, sex, relationships, drugs, whatever desires they have, and that considered to be a good thing, then I see no problem with that. I think that's a really important thing to do. I also think it's the most accurate way of covering the country. Yet at the same time, we are not for a second suggesting that people do not live in one of the most isolated, most the most everything country in the world. And it's an incredibly difficult place to live. I mean, even the economic order I just described, think of the daily headache that that provides to people. We are under no illusion whatsoever that this is not somewhere you want to exist. What is so fascinating is that people do live comparatively normal lives, despite those challenges. But one of the, you bring up political prison camps, that is one of the most interesting areas, right? And it's very much the centre of tension at the minute, as we still sit on the back of the UN's Commission of Inquiry report into North Korean human rights. And these are horrific places. They are, as Judge Michael Kirby said when he released this report, there are very, very few modern comparisons to this beyond, say, what the Nazis had done in Germany. I don't know if that is It's a simplifying comparison. It's potentially sensationalist, but nonetheless, it it underscores just how horrific these places are. And that is why we devote a lot of time to writing about it, and also how this plays into the psychology, into the minds of normal people. People sort of know about them, that they don't really know necessarily where they are, or they don't really know what life is like there. People disappear, they hear about it. So it's this kind of constant grey cloud over people's heads. We even have a grey cloud on the front of the uh, book for that very reason. But at the same time, it also has a normal prison system because North Koreans are driven by normal desires and because the likes of drugs, for example, are very popular and people need to make money. There are normal criminals too. Not every crime in North Korea is a political crime. It is, of course, deplorable that people commit political crimes and then are put into political prisons, but there are also murderers and thieves who get put into slightly more normal prisons. But which you mention in the book, actually, there's a specific... Uh, which we do, exactly. Mm. We break. It's important, we think, to understand how the prison system works because it's not necessarily the case that you only go to these political prisons. Um, after finishing your book, what were your, I would say conclusions when it comes to the future of North Korea, when it comes to the regime, when it comes to engaging also North Korea, should we just do business with them? It seems to be the best way to bring about change. When we wrote the book, we set out to write a book about North Korea today, what it's like to live there now. And at the same time, it would be unfair of us if we didn't sort of try and extrapolate this into some kind of useful tool that we can use to understand how it might turn out in the future. One of the constant battles that the government has to deal with is with this difficult relationship it has with the unofficial economy. But as I've mentioned, we see them slowly accommodating this. They start to change things, they start to maybe change their policy, they use the grey market rates a little bit more widespread. And the, these are these are interesting, very, very slow, gradual changes, but they are examples of the government slowly kind of loosening up a little bit and letting this happen. 
And now, if the government was not to do that, then it would probably face a very bleak future. It would also almost certainly lose completely the uh, trust of its of its people. So one thing that's really important for them is to work work this out. So in terms of a prediction, and it is just a prediction, and I'm sure I will laugh at myself in two years when it's all a free and open democracy and McDonald's is in uh, Pyongyang, it seems to me at least a lot more likely that it will adopt some kind of slow and gradual acceptance of this. And I don't really want to say reform or opening up because it, it really is going to be very, very gradual and it's probably going to be a very long and drawn out process. You mentioned should we do business with them. It's not illegal to do business with um, North Korea. It is, of course, illegal to do business with North Korean entities involved who are sanctioned involved in illegal activities. And it's no secret that foreign direct investment would certainly change things in many ways. But let's be honest, there aren't many sensible business people who are going to want to invest in a country which will suddenly set off a nuclear device and destroy the stock markets in the surrounding countries or just be generally in, um, unstable. There is, of course, the, the good example of the Egyptian firm Orozcom, which helped set up the mobile phone networks, which, as far as I recall, hasn't managed to reap much of it. It's made a lot of money inside the country, but it can't get the money out. So it is not really an attractive destination for business foreign direct investors, even though that might actually affect some kind of change there, yes. So that's what the government has to deal with. Something else could happen. There could be uh, minor unrest. There could be a horrible accident where Kim Jong-un crashes his plane into the Juche Tower. Um, we just we just don't know. The more sensible, the more, the more likely, the more, should I say, measured guesstimate in this case would be that the government slowly follows this kind of market change. It accommodates it. And we eventually see a North Korea, which politically probably doesn't really change much at all, but economically nonetheless is a little bit more similar to China. But North Korea, of course, exists in a very, very different geopolitical um, setting to China and is faced with a whole different set of challenges. So that is a very long-winded way of saying I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> is it a fair conclusion that North Korea is, in a sense, schizophrenic? It has two economic systems has two societies, the official, you know, obeisance, but at the same time people being more and more um, emboldened, and then two foreign policies, promising death, but at the same time opening, I think it was 14 special economic zones. It is a country of contradictions, yes. And that's one of the really interesting things about the book, and I encourage you to read it to find out exactly what they are. James Pearson, thank you very much for being our guest for this episode. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.